so I had I had my proudest moment as a father. Okay. Right. Um, I, I told you my my industry used to have a lot more hotheads in it. Yeah, yeah. And those hotheads just were, you know, they a lot of them retired. Yeah. Um, but but more and more, you just see less and less. Of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a rule at my house: we don't yell, mm-hmm. right? Unless uh, unless someone's doing something dangerous mm-hmm. to themselves or others, mm-hmm. right? And my seven-year-old actually forgot what it sounded like for me to yell. He actually had no idea. He said, Daddy, I think you yelled at me the other day. And my, my, my nine-year-old said, no, I didn't. Dad, Dad didn't yell at you. <laughs> and I had to remind him, like, okay, this is what yelling sounds like, right? And he just he forgot me. He just didn't know. Yeah. Right? Um, so, anyways, the, you, you learn to take a lot more in stride. Yeah. You learn to, to, to sort of remove a little bit of the emotion out of any perceived issue. Yeah. Right? Um, just one, just at least one layer of the onion worth of emotion. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I think, you know, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that my job has put me in situations, right? Um, where I get to see people, you know, um, at high levels of emotional tension. Yeah. And I get to react to them um, with a little more perspective and understanding. Mm-hmm. Right. I think it, it, it may make me a better father. This is the Untamed Ethos Podcast. Join us as investment pros, executives, and other experts talk business, personal growth, investing, politics, and the trending topics well-rounded pros need to know about. Authentic, unfiltered, and fun. Joshua Wilson is the founder of United Ethos Wealth Partners, a registered investment advisor. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of United Ethos's investment advice on this podcast, and nothing you'll hear on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. All opinions expressed by Joshua and by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of United Ethos or its affiliates. Welcome back to Untamed Ethos. I'm your host, Joshua Wilson, and with me today is Peter Mosley. He's a corporate restructuring advisor with Alvarez and Marsal, a global consultancy that works with some of the biggest firms in the world uh, when they have financial trouble. So uh, with with, uh, Peter today, we hope to glean glean some insights about the market, what we can understand about the future, and also just kind of get to understand what is it a restructuring uh, consultant does and what can what are what, what might they be able to see about the economy and the market that we on the street don't see on a day to set day? Peter, welcome to Untamed Vethos. Thanks for having me, man. Awesome. Good to be here. Yeah. Well, Peter, give me let's start us off and tell us first off, who is Alvarez and Marsal and what is it exactly that you do? Gotcha. Well, Tony Alvarez, Brian Marsal, those are actual people, right? They they opened up their own consulting firm um, in the, I want to say, late 80s and really made a name for themselves working with distressed companies, right? Um, Companies whose balance sheet and the operations no longer sustain each other long term. Um, And then in the early 2000s, uh, when when Anderson went kaput, um, a lot of those partners were looking for a, a new shop, right? Because they had, they were big into consulting as well, and really the firm doubled in size, right? Went from twenty people to fifty people, and uh, it's just been growing ever since, right? Adding additional service lines, working with more than just distressed clients, we're now up to about ten thousand consultants worldwide. Wow. Yeah. And what is a typical client? So, for me personally, I'm in the North American corporate restructuring. Mm-hmm. Um, division. And so I only work with companies that are, are in distress situations or business failure situations and that have borrowed more than call it a billion dollars worth of debt. Right? So large corporate clients. Right. Um, and I look at all sort of options to, to work out that debt to try to you know, 
help them get from A to B uh, towards delevering. But a lot of times that involves Chapter 11 bankruptcy as a tool. Mm -hmm. So how much of this becomes, I feel like when, you, when you're starting at something like this, it seems like I just think spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> <laughs> moving numbers from here, moving numbers to there. But I would imagine it gets to a point where it becomes much more of a relationship business. Is that your experience? Oh, goodness. So my job, really the entire company's job, right, um, when they're in distress is to maximize the value available to the other parties involved. And it, there's a lot of got to hold that organization together um, and sort of tell people, educate people on what's coming next, right? Um, a lot of guiding, a lot of leadership involved with that, making sure, you know, people understand what's coming next and aren't afraid of it, right? Because let's be honest, everyone wants to avoid distressed restructuring of situations, business failure situations. No one says, hey, you know what I want to do? I want to get into bankruptcies one day, <laughs> right? And, and so they spend all their time thinking about staying away from it. They don't really understand the process. Mm -hmm. And so providing that education sort of takes away some of the fear Right, and it's a lot of what we do. Um, I think it's, it's, yeah, there's the spreadsheets, that's, that's great, but if there's no one left at the company to, mm -hmm. to help you fill out those spreadsheets, they're not really worth much. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, a big part of it's educating, help, helping the, the leaders of the company communicate in a way to their, to their, um, their personnel that takes away fear and lets them know that there's a steady hand on the wheel. Mm -hmm. so beyond the, the, the financials of, of you know, maybe you're restructuring debt or putting on different types of debt, is that is that typically what ends up happening is you're changing a debt structure or is it wrapping up a company, more of a liquidation, or is it, you, you never know when you're getting into it? <clears throat> so I typically don't deal with liquidations mm -hmm. just because at, at the size of companies that I'm dealing with, mm -hmm it's pretty rare that they just go away. Um, what I tell clients is that if you make a product that people actually want at a price point that is competitive, there will be life outside of Chapter 11 bankruptcy for you. You, you will continue on as a company, right? Um, for the most part, you're not issuing more debt. Rarely is more debt the solution. <laughs> um, so typically, you're, you're converting some debt into equity, mm -hmm. right? Or you're selling off divisions, pieces of the company um, to pay down debt. Mm -hmm. You're doing one of those two things. So a lot of times um, in a restructuring situation, a Chapter 11 situation, uh, shareholders will, will get wiped out, get canceled, right, um, as part of that process. And, you know, bondholders or debt holders will end up receiving new shares mm -hmm. in the emerging entity. Do you see when you're talking to companies, and I'm assuming you're working with multiple companies at a time, and you see the deal flow that's coming to your company, does that suggest anything about the economy as a whole? Does volume suggest something? Or what, is, what does it tell you? What do you look for? Well, I think you can look at the corporate default rate, right? So when you think about, well, Peter, what do you do, right, for like a living? Um, I, I tell people, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like a fixer or a janitor for, for Wall Street, right? I, I, I deal- That's it, Janet, the janitor of Wall Street. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be quotable. <laughs> um, but so you have your guys that are underwriting equities. You have your guys that are underwriting new debt issuances, right? And they're selling those off. And that, that's what people think of when they think of Wall Street. Well, call it between one and 8% of those deals go bad, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on the year, right? And we call that the corporate default rate. Right. And that's something that you track and that's measured, you know? Um, and what I see is I get busy when the corporate default rate goes up, right? Um, because more companies are defaulting on their debt. And, and need to, to come to some sort of resolution, right? So uh, what I'd, I'd say is corporate default rate, 
almost doubled last year from 2022. And it's probably going to go from 3 to 4%, if not higher, um, this year. It's projected to go higher this year. Um, and what that means is, you know, value is likely to change hands, right? So um, value is likely to, to need to come to some sort of transaction, right? And uh, you, you, also, you also look at, when you're in my line of work, you're very aware of sort of maturities, yeah. right? I'm, I'm constantly looking at corporate debt maturities, right? Because um, those are, if that debt doesn't get refinanced, that's my client list, basically. Um, and when you, you look at sort of the interest rates on the maturing debt versus the interest rates on the new debt that, that corporate clients are getting, you can see that, yeah, there's, th this is not a sustainable, um, um, these debt levels, mm -hmm. right, are, they're high. And they're getting, it's getting much more expensive for the clients to borrow, yeah. right? Uh, so big corporations are going to have to get creative in, in thinking about how they increase their profit margin in the future, how they increase their profit, sh their, their market share in the future. How do they service that debt, mm -hmm. right? Because deleveraging got a lot harder yeah. with those interest rates going up. Well, yeah. The a lot of my audience is business owners and small business owners and, uh, and executives from, from different levels. And, you know, this is something that people deal with. I mean, obviously, everyone's not a, a Fortune 500 or billion dollar company. Sure. But oh, people have debt and they're thinking the same things for their for their business. What what would, what advice would you give someone who's thinking, who's facing these issues is, hey, I've got debt and I've benefited from this low interest rate environment and I'm thinking about, re, you know, can I refinance or you talk about creative ways, you know, kind of before you have to call the, uh, the corporate restructuring guy, what advice do you have or what, how should people be thinking? Yeah. Um, I'd say the worst thing they can do is wait to the last moment to deal with it. Yeah. Right. That's the worst thing they can do. Um, there's, Alvarez Marcel is a full service consultancy firm. And so uh, we have, I deal with just restructuring, but we have groups that do revenue enhancement, that look at costs and help people take costs out of business, right? Um, look at all, how do, I, how do I appropriately apply technology to my business so I run more efficiently? Um, you gotta do it all. You gotta, you gotta, think, you know, you gotta think about it all. Um, by the time the clients that I have are at that scale, the management teams are so professional yeah. that by the time they call me, they've likely looked at all those yeah. things. Um, but you gotta look at all those things, right? You gotta look early. And what I'd say is dealing with an upcoming maturity, right? Dealing with upcoming debt maturity. Don't wait to the last minute to start talking to your banks. Don't wait to the last minute to start talking to your lenders about the problems and about the potential solutions that they can be a part of. Because one, financial institutions move at a much different speed yeah. than most businesses think. And they even move at different speeds compared to each other, right? And if you wait to the last moment, all of the leverage is in their hands yeah. at that point. Time equals leverage in many cases. And so, at least leverage for maneuverability. Mm -hmm. So get that conversation started early, right? And what, what, what constitutes early? As soon as your little Excel forecast says, I'm gonna have a problem in 12 months, or I'm gonna have a problem in 18 months, mm -hmm. right? Get out ahead of it. Mm -hmm. um, you, see, you, see, you see corporates do this, you're seeing it a little bit now, um, where you'll, you'll see some random refinancing of, of, a, of a big debt issuance mm -hmm. a year early, Yeah. right? I mean, they don't know what, if interest rates are gonna go up or down, they don't right. know, but they're getting ahead of it early because they know they don't want to negotiate it at the last second. Right, yeah. You mentioned that the, the default rate doubled mm -hmm. last year and you kind of gave us this general one to 8%. 
when you say 8%, is that a, That's, is that a 2008 scenario? Exactly. Or, okay. Global financial crisis. Okay. Right? Um, and it was hovering, it was below 1%, I want to say in 2021, mm -hmm. right? So like after all the COVID stimulus. Yeah. Um, and it, it was, I want to say it was like at 1.5% in 2022. Mm -hmm. It went up to 3%. Um, for 2023, mm -hmm. and now they're projecting it somewhere between four and five, mm -hmm. right? For 2024, um, we don't, we won't know until it's in the books. But what people don't understand is, even though that's only half, right, mm -hmm. roughly of, of of where it was at the global financial crisis, the amount of debt, corporate debt, has more than doubled. It's almost tripled since the global financial crisis. So, you know, we're as busy as we've ever been. <clears throat> Because, you know, as far as the amount of debt that's flowing out there that needs to be addressed, it's as much already as it was during the, the Great Recession. So in relative terms, we're still half as much or less than half as much as, as, as far as the um, percentage, relatively. But in absolute terms, there's just a lot more. There's a lot more debt. Bigger stacks, bigger problems. And more stacks. Yeah. <laughs> more borrowers. Yeah. What does that mean? Because now I start thinking about, you know, you guys are as big as you've ever been. And uh, I, I checked out your uh, your LinkedIn. It looks like you guys are hiring hand over fist right now. Or we, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is just a reflection of, of the increased volume. And are you going to be able to hire fast enough? I mean, when I, when I think about something like this and, you know, when you hear 1% to 2%, yeah, I know that's doubling, but it sure doesn't sound like a lot because you right. don't know the numbers that are behind it. Right. It goes two to the present three percent, and that doesn't sound like a right. lot. Right, twenty to twenty-five trillion exactly. in the U.S. <laughs> yes. Right, one percent's a lot. <laughs> yes, yes. And so you know when you're when you've had years where you've kind of had this volume of of one to two percent, and also you're saying there's, the, the stacks are higher. These one percent means a lot more than it used to. Um, what happens if there's not enough folks to, to help people through this? Is, is that, could that be a concern? Well, I'd say there's, 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 it's a legal process, mm -hmm. right? So will there be enough lawyers to help companies go through the legal process? Most likely, right? Supply will, yeah. raise the demand um, obviously we're hiring we're we're training folks all the time we're promoting folks all the time I'd say that you know we're a human capital business yeah. that's why you see so many job postings mm -hmm. on, on LinkedIn um, and for, from our standpoint we'll if you know the market determines that hey you know if there's too many um, big corporates we'll just select the bigger corporates mm -hmm. you know you know, when I started the firm in 2008, we take the we'll take we would take clients at a much lower debt threshold yeah. than what we take clients now, right? We just continue to work with bigger and bigger clients yeah. with the expertise we have, right? We try to maximize our impact, right, mm -hmm. uh, with our clients based on the people we have. But at the end of the day, it's a human capital business, right? So we are constantly looking to attract and retain mm -hmm. the most talented people we can, as many of them as we can, um, and make sure that all of our people understand, hey, you have 10,000 resumes, right, to apply to any problem that a business may face, right? And, and the more people I have in that bullpen, mm -hmm. the, the, the more weapons I have at my disposal to address any issues that a, a company will face in these situations. Yeah. Yeah. And how much of this, um, when you, let me take this a different direction. Yeah. When you're, when you see the, obviously you see corporate default rates, you see the type of companies maybe that are coming to you. Is there any information that you, that, that tells you something about the economy or what people on Main Street are going to feel maybe in their wallets or maybe what's going to, what we're going to feel in the stock market? For example, the things that everyday people are experiencing. Is there anything you see in maybe the types of business or the types of problems that you're having that we should be think that, that we can use as kind of a beacon for us on Main Street? <clears throat> so I'd say all the major trends, 
right, of where are the most restructurings? And they just follow, well, where was where was a debt issue, mm. right? <laughs> um, so I'd say in, in 2007, right, 2008, we were issuing a lot of debt in, into home mortgages, right? Right. And, and commercial real estate, right? Um, well, when all that dried up, that money went somewhere. That mm. big money flow went somewhere, and, mm. and a lot of oil and gas companies were getting those loans, right? Um, and then you saw a massive wave in 2015 of oil and gas companies that needed to file for bankruptcy mm. because they were, we, we, we overbuilt and supply didn't meet demands. We were oversupplied, mm -hmm. and the, the average cost per per MCF of natural gas and barrel oil plummeted, and you know we need to restructure those deals. Mm -hmm. Um, so it'll it'll go in waves. It'll follow wherever the lending has been. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, what I'd say is, think macro, right? Um, if 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 you you're looking for advice, right? It's like think macro. Um, look at that maturity wall. Uh, I think people get really caught up with fundamentals as far as the equity yeah. goes. And they look at that those fundamentals and they say, oh, okay, I see the earnings, I see, I see the the you know, the market cap, <clears throat> I see this is the amount of debt, but they don't think about, well, what's the interest rate on that debt? What's the maturity of that debt? Right? Like when <laughs> when does that come and do? When does that need to roll over? Right? And what might the borrowing cost be of of when it rolls over? Yeah. I don't think people necessarily think about it that way in, in enough detail, mm -hmm. right? Um, you don't see a lot of coverage about the debt in that level of detail. So you, we we hear coverage about mortgages all the time. Correct. Mortgage rates. So um, I think most folks would tell you what mortgage rates are, or at least it have been the last month or something like that. Kind of explain to us um, what you see in, or how interest rates have changed in the corporate world um, for different types of debt and um, credit worthiness? They've gone up, right, um, from where they were 12 months ago. Um, that being said, there was a big portion last year where it felt like there wasn't a lot of credit available. Mm -hmm. there, it felt like there was low liquidity. Um, and I'd say January was a, a record-breaking month for high-yield issuances. Um, so. I think we, we are addressing some of those liquidity concerns. The market's addressing some of those liquidity concerns. Um, and these deals are competitive, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I'd say that's one thing that, that I've learned uh, just due to my perspective, right? We're, we're looking at a lot of refinancing transactions on the way out of a restructuring. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these lenders compete with each other. So the more liquidity there is, there's more competition. That helps keep interest rates in check. Um, but they're still much higher than they were during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. and, and even pre-COVID. It might not be readily apparent, like as a Main Street person, mm -hmm. right? Is that the institutions that are underwriting your securities that you're trading in, they're not necessarily incentivized based on whether or not that security goes up in value or right. down in value. They're not, they're not incentivized by that at all. They're incentivized to get that deal done, right? right? And to appropriately price in the risk of that security failing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then they all compete with each other, right? Uh, and so I, I think people oftentimes will look at that underwriting, discount that underwriting, but who underwrites those deals matters Right and and um, understanding the incentive structure that those people face matters, mm -hmm. I think. So, when you say that understanding who is underwriting the deals matters, can you elaborate on that? Is that is that the size of the firms or the particular names of the firms? I don't know if you can talk about those things or not, or at some level maybe. What do you mean by it matters who? Just, I won't call out specific firms, yeah. but I, I'll, I'll just say, like, it's just something worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Those dictate the trends of, of uh, defaults, maybe, or? It, they, they dictate the quality of the underwriting. Got it. The quality and the competitiveness of the, uh, competitiveness of the underwriting. Yeah. Um, 
talk to me about the human element of this. You know, when you're when you're talking to these firms, and obviously they're going through things they've never gone through before. These are typically extremely professional people that have mm-hmm. done things that have plenty of experience. And now they're going through something they've never been through before, and it's outside of their comfort zone, and it's mm-hmm. outside of their employees' comfort zone, obviously. Um, is there some element of coaching or that, that, is, that is part of this? Um, it's almost like therapy. Yeah. <laughs> well, get, tell, tell me a story uh, about, a, about a client and, and how you've worked with this, um, how, the, how this kind of therapy session type, type of develops or what are the missing pieces that during a time of distress that you're trying to help professionals with? I yeah. Mean, uh, Everybody you know, goes through something that they're struggling with in a business at a certain point, and their employees feel that, and it may not be a major corporate restructuring. Right. But but what have you learned about about this? So, I deal with people and my clients uh, when they're going through a very tough time mm-hmm. professionally, uh, because a lot of them don't, they don't know they don't have the same perspective that I have about like what I had said before, uh, this company will exist on the other side of a bankruptcy, on the other side of a business failure, mm-hmm. if it creates a product or provides a service that people want at a competitive price. Mm-hmm. They, don't, they don't necessarily have that perspective. So they're afraid they're gonna lose their job. Right. Here I am, some guy in a suit, asking a bunch of questions about how the business runs and about cash flows, and they think, I'm gonna be the guy to fire them. Right? Yeah. They, they've all seen up in the air. They think this is, there's this guy named Bob who's going to come fire them. Yeah. Right. Um, and and sort of explaining to them, educating them, like, okay, no, this is what happens. Right. Some guy made a mistake and projected either way too much cash coming off this company, or you know, put way too much debt on this company for some reason, and now we have to deal with it. Right. Here are the steps by which we are going to get from A to B, mm-hmm. and you're a part of that, right? A lot of times people are overworked. Also, um, I, I, I've seen a number of terrible business mistakes mm-hmm. um, made, uh, trying to, um, you know, throw the hail mary pass and, and score yeah, the touchdown, yeah. right? Um, but what what it ultimately leads to is less people, right, doing more work, mm-hmm. right? And, and a lot of times when I'm dealing with people at these companies, they're overworked, right? They haven't, they haven't, you know, had a normal week in months, yeah. right? And, and so focusing them on the things that actually matter mm-hmm. and that will actually move the needle, will actually get this company a little bit closer mm-hmm. to, um, to being having a right size balance sheet, right? right? Um, that fills sort of the leadership void, right? Mm-hmm. For them. And, and all of a sudden they say, okay, what? Well, I get it. I understand that I've got a job here. Mm-hmm. And I understand how to get from A to B. And typically people start to just snap into place and say, yeah, okay, that's what I needed. Mm-hmm. Now I can push this thing forward. They're yeah. happy to push. They're happy to work hard. Um, what they what they tend to flee from is a leadership void, or or, or a lack of, of sort of management clarity. Mm-hmm. Right? How do I get out of this mess? Um, and if if you can't give them that, they'll flee. Mm-hmm. Right? They'll they'll go find other jobs. Right? Unemployment rate's still pretty low, mm-hmm. um, and that's there's nothing more disastrous right for creditors in a company um, than when the company just sort of dissolves underneath their their their, their hands, right? Yeah. Because there's a lack of leadership. Um, when you when you asked me before, like what happens if there just aren't enough consultants, mm-hmm. guys like me, leaders, to, to who have been through the situation and help companies through it? Well, then you're going to see more liquidations, mm-hmm. and that's probably just what's going to happen. Is pe- people are going to leave those companies, especially if unemployment stays low, and there's not a lot of value there unless there's hard assets to sell. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the biggest assets any company has is its people. Mm-hmm. And as a managing director at Alvarez and Marsal, 
do you typically work with a team and who you have different types of, of specialists that are on your team that, that work with you on these projects and what is your role on the team specifically? Yeah, so we deploy in, in various sizes, right? Mm -hmm. um, it just depends on the situation, depends on the company. Um, but I'd say the, you know, most typical, mm -hmm. right? When we come into to these situations, you're, you're deploying, you know, a few people to make sure that the C-suite level guys understand what's coming next. Yeah. That, that's, that's sort of baseline. You're, you're advising the C-suite mm -hmm. on how to get from A to B in this process, right? Typically, um, you need much tighter cash controls, right, as you're trying to navigate this process. Yeah. So that's usually the next, the next place that we're, we're looking at, right, is, okay, where are the cash controls? Are, can, can we report cash on a, on a weekly basis and understand what we're spending our money on, mm. where, where the, the risks and opportunities are on the revenue side. Right? So we're looking at cash and then we go down to, okay, business plan projections, right? Like how have we been doing that in the past and what's our real business plan going forward? So we'll typically look at that, right? And then you have sort of the administrative side. So I, I tell people we do three things, right? One, we're negotiators in chief. We got to negotiate with Creditors, we got to negotiate with vendors. You got to negotiate with unions. You got to negotiate basically with everyone who has a stake in the company. Mm. Um, and then part two is um, <clears throat> we help companies shoulder the administrative burden of a Chapter Eleven case or a transaction, right, or an out of court transaction. So there's a lot of analysis um, around negotiating and shouldering that burden. That frankly, management teams just, they don't typically do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, they they try to avoid these situations. They don't typically do. My team, we do those analyses every day. Mm. Right. And so it's just faster to have us do them. Um, and usually time is of the essence. And then the last thing we do is serve what I call business consulting light. Right. Um, my, I'm trying to extend that timeline. Right. I, we were talking before about how time is leverage in these mm -hmm. situations. So is there a way I can, I can you know, extend that, that timeline by reducing our burn rate, mm -hmm. right? Understanding exactly how long that timeline is so that the investment bankers or the lawyers can, can actually negotiate um, and understand this is the amount of time that they have. Um, can we survive certain, certain events, mm -hmm. right? Um, those are the main things that we do. Uh, I'd say part of being, um, part of having a big firm and a lot of resumes at my disposal is as I do those things, I'm seeing other issues within the business. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing customer contracts that need to be renegotiated. I'm seeing vendor contracts need to be renegotiated. I'm seeing, you know, um, inefficient tax structures. I'm seeing all sorts of things that, you know, I bring in uh, my other groups, mm -hmm. my other specialists to address. Um, I'm seeing litigation risk, mm -hmm. right? That I'm bringing in my my experts to testify to, yeah. right? So that we can we can get from A to B efficiently, right? Um, so helping management navigate the process and then deploying the necessary resources, whether it be within my firm or frankly outside of my firm. Um, to to address the issues that a company is going to face to get to the other side yeah. of a chapter eleven restructuring, that's what I do day to day. That, yeah. That's sort of my that's my wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's kind of running to the fire first, and these are the biggest the, the biggest fires or or the the hottest fires, and then trying to kind of look at the entire building and say, okay, where can we prevent other problems? Where can we? Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's a fire. Sometimes it's just the, you know, the the pile of rubble. Yeah. Right. And I need to get creditors. I'm trying to maximize the the value of that pile of rubble. Um, I'm trying to to get creditors to to understand like this is what, you know, this is what's available. Let's talk about what you'd likely be entitled to. You're right. We can fight about some of these things, 
or we can we can agree to settle. Yeah. Right. Um, and and this is what you can expect in either of those scenarios. Right. So you've learned a lot about what creditors care about. Oh yeah. Uh, they this. tell me constantly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well give, give, tell me tell me tell me a story. Uh, you know, tell me a time when you learned when you learned a lesson about what creditors care about. Oh goodness. Um, so what I'll say is, U.S. creditors, U.S.-based creditors in these big cases, they're very rational actors, mm -hmm. right? Um, they 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 understand the dollars and cents, right? Like, yeah, I can spend ten million dollars fighting this, or I can settle this for yeah. for, for five. I'm going to settle it for five. Why wouldn't I settle it for five? Right. Right. Um, and I'd say a lot of them care about control, right? A lot of them care about um, making sure that, that their rights are protected. They feel like they're, a, you know, by owning a security, they get certain creditor rights and that their rights are protected. Some of them are very, um, you know, they watch that very closely. Um, some of them, you know, trust is an issue especially with with management teams that, that have, have been there a long time they 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 want to talk to these guys on a regular basis they want to know that the management team is acting in the best interest of creditors which is frankly their their fiduciary duty right. in, a, in, a, in an insolvency situation um, and so communication so much of it's solved by communication right communication establishing trust um, so, so much of of that sort of dynamic of control mm -hmm. is solved by communication mm -hmm. um, with the management team and and with those creditors um you know I, i'd say n no one likes to be a minority shareholder in a privately held entity mm -hmm. right they, they care about liquidity um post-emergence uh, they, they 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 care that um you know people are are stewarding their resources because at that point they really are footing the bill for what is essentially the the post-emergence the mm -hmm. post restructuring company it's coming out of their recovery mm -hmm. so they care that people are being good stewards of of those resources mm -hmm. right and like i you know if, if they want to talk about certain disbursements if they want to talk about certain legal issues we're facing or why we why we're doing this or why we're doing that i have all day for that because yeah. Frankly, it's it's just a matter of trust, mm -hmm. um, and and at the end of the day, like if you want to get a company through bankruptcy, I, I tell people, you know, any moron can sort of walk you into a litigation, yeah. right? Any moron can can walk you into a fight, mm -hmm. um, but where you, you hire a firm like A and M, you hire the our our partners, right? The the, the lawyers and the investment bankers, because we can you know, get people to a consensual place yeah. where, hey, the best thing to do here is not to fight. It's never to fight. Yeah. It, it's to make sure that people are getting what is fair yeah. and it's all done consensually. Um, so that that's, you know, from from my perspective, you know, the, the, um, the things that the creditors really care about, right, is, is, Help me understand that I'm not getting screwed here. Yeah. Right. Help me, help me get there, and 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 then we can get out of this without without having a fight. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'll say is, not all creditors are the same. Mm -hmm. um, and and what I've found is, especially, um, especially as the U.S. has attracted foreign foreign creditors, right? right? They don't necessarily understand our legal system mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so the education process can be more difficult mm -hmm. um, and, and there, there's more emotion involved. And I can't, I can't solve for an emotional decision, right? Yeah. I, can, I can try to build trust. I can tell people the truth, mm -hmm. right? But I can't solve for emotional actors, mm -hmm. right? Those you just have to be in a position to fight your way out through. Yeah. You, know, you talk about the importance of communication, and that's something I topic I really enjoy um, <laughs> but with communication you know like communication is important well you know in these sometimes bitter sometimes regret sometimes always frustration sure and uh, in these 
you know, that something that someone hopes they never have to go through, but now they're going through it and people are breathing down their neck and now they probably got, they've often got problems at home now in a lot of situations because <laughs> sure. those things tend to bleed, uh, bleed over and now you've got uncertainty at home and these sorts of things. What have you learned about how to communicate and feel free to go and in deep into the weeds or deep into a, 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 you know, a narrative of here is specifically something I've learned about communicating during a different, a difficult time. And it could be a definitely don't do this or I've seen this happen and here's a better way. But give me some micro lessons on communication. Oof. Oof. Um, I'd say our industry, mm -hmm. my industry has really matured over the course of my involvement in it, mm -hmm. right? Started in the industry called 2004, so mm -hmm. it's been 20 years. And we used to have a, a reputation for having a lot of hotheads in mm -hmm. the industry because we had a lot of hotheads in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'd say is over time, the people who were most successful at really doing what I was talking about, right? Just coming up to a consensus so we're not always fighting on everything, mm -hmm. um, stopped being the hotheads Mm -hmm. Right, because more and more creditors sort of got wise, like they, I'm not gonna get bullied. Yeah. Right. Um, and started to be the guys who would could calmly educate people yeah. on the situation mm -hmm. um, and walk them through any logic tree that they want to go down. Right. Yeah. Investors want to understand what's going on at the company. Um, people at the company and the clients, they. They don't want to deal with a hothead. Yeah. They want to deal with someone who's a calm voice of reason, right? So that over time has really been a, a big change. Um, and, and I think more and more we're, we're seen as these are guys who keep their cool in every situation, mm -hmm. right? Um, we call ourselves professional crisis managers, mm -hmm. right? Um, we, we, we can go through these situations and, you know, keep a level tone, keep a level head, understand like, all right, these, this is the economic outlook for this person. I'm not necessarily, you know, a, an actor. I'm not an economic actor in that. Mm -hmm. I, that. That's not, you know, money out of my pocket, but I can educate this person as to if I were in their shoes, this is, this is how I'd look at it. Um, people... There's been a lot of, you know, study around what people hear and what people see, mm -hmm. um, and, and how they take in sort of your presence mm -hmm. and the content of what you have to say. Well, that's important. A lot of times, how you present it is even more important. Yeah. Right. Um, so, what I've learned is, one, people want to know why they're doing things. Mm -hmm. They don't just want to know what what they're doing. They want to know why they're doing it. So start with their why, not yours, not I need to do this. I need this done, right? I need this particular um, analysis done right. so that, you know, you can get through bankruptcy. It's you want to get through bankruptcy, sir, right? So so you're going to need this analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So just simple things like flipping it to this is why it's important for your audience versus why it's important to me, mm -hmm. right? It's a subtle difference, but it makes all the difference in the world to the person listening, mm -hmm. right? Um, same goes with the creditors, right? Like, this is why you should settle this, right? Versus, you know, I need this much money to go settle it. It, it, is, it is received in an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. The tone of voice, right? We call it the, the late night DJ voice, right? Like, like that matters. If you can deliver bad news, the way you deliver it really matters. Um, it, it, it's, it's been an interesting journey from that standpoint, right? Because at the beginning, it was all about the numbers. And now, like if, if you were to ask me, like, you know, especially with sort of all the new emerging technologies coming out, well, what's the most important thing for, for my job? Right? It's one education, understand the process, the experience, right? Um, that you're not gonna get 
unless you go through these situations. Yeah. But two, like, how are you crafting a story? How are you delivering that message? Hmm. That that that's going to matter, right? It's going to matter. In the, it's going to show up in your documents that you produce. It's going to show up in you know the pitches you're in. It's going to show up in your negotiations in a big way. It's going to show up with how you deal with the client, how successful you are dealing with your teammates. Mm -hmm. Is there an element of, you say you're crafting a story, it, this is about the, the why story, or it, it, it's about the company's story? Tell me, tell me more about that. So it can be about anything that needs to get done, right? This is why I need your help to do this, right? Any, anything that I need to do, the analysis I need to do, any piece of the company I need to look at, right? Um, we need to pay this vendor. Well, let's talk about why, right? Why we need to pay this vendor. Um, I think the the revenue growth rate is going to be X. All right, let's talk about why that, that matters. Um, at the end of the day, when we are sort of putting together a new business plan that creditors are gonna reorganize around, um, we gotta tell them the story. We got to, it's an investment story, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, this, is, this is why we think the company is able to do this mm -hmm. from, a, from a, a revenue standpoint, from a, an EBITDA standpoint going forward, right? The way you craft and tell that story, that's gonna matter, mm -hmm. right? Um, we are fast approaching the day when, you know, the Excel spreadsheet's largely a commodity. It's just simple yeah. math. I, I tell our analysts, like, it's, it's addition, subtraction, and multiplication. If you're dividing something, you're probably doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>? mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it, it, even, even those tools, right, even the, that part of the analysis, it's all about how do I make this analysis so that it's easy to understand and tell the story of what I'm trying to communicate here, mm -hmm. right? Um, Machines don't do that part well yet, no. right? Um, that needs a little bit of context. Mm -hmm. well, tell, me, tell us about a deal so we can get kind of into the weeds of, uh, of, this, of the narrative and the kind of things that you navigate and especially around the stories that you kind of tell to the different people involved in these things mm -hmm. because you know, they, they, they're all, as you mentioned, it's not my story, it's your story. And so you're seeing you're having to tell different stories. It's, it's forcing you, you know, I'm trying to think of a movie, but the certain movies will, um, I've seen in the past, will, will, will tell a story, but you're seeing it from this character's eyes, then yeah. you're seeing it from this character's eyes, rather than just being the type of movie that just kind of shows you the picture of everything. Yeah. Right? You're seeing it from different perspectives. So tell me about, about um, how you've had to paint different stories in a, in, a, in, a, in a live scenario and some of the lessons you learned from it. Mm. So, I don't typically talk about clients by name, um, but I'll say, you know, we can talk about Blockbuster because okay. there's not too many of those. Right? Blockbuster. And, it, right, and, right, it, and right. it was a long, long time ago. Story of my childhood. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of Friday nights spent at Blockbuster as, as exactly. a kid. So. Exactly. So before smartphones took over the world. Correct. Before smartphones took over the world, a typical family of four on a Friday night, they're going to Blockbuster. And Blockbuster was an event. You saw your friends at Blockbuster. It was a community center. It was a community center. Yeah. And this is before every TV had any movie you could imagine just on demand. You'd walk into a video store and you got to look and, and browse the aisles and see, do I want to watch Step Brothers? Do I want to watch... What do I want to rent? And you pay money and rent a video and take it home with you and keep it for two nights or five nights or whatever. They also had video games at these places um, and you could buy all your snacks. And so it was kind of a, a community experience, a family experience. And the video rental store was a uh, an institution in American culture. If you weren't going to the movies, you were often renting a movie um, you know, uh, at, at these stores. And then of course, the online revolution and <laughs> smartphones and everything. And then all of a sudden it's this industry is you know, Netflix. All of a sudden Netflix was sending discs to your house and then sending them back before Netflix was a streaming service. So you had this, uh, this change in the world where 
uh, information was becoming digital, and digital available, digitally available. And so we sneak right in here and see that Blockbuster is starting to suffer from the writing on the wall of a changing world, and this affects their finances. Yeah, so, so 2009, um, 2010 is, is sort of the, um, was, you know, about when they filed for bankruptcy. Um, and, you know, we were, we were fighting a terrible retail trend. Yeah. Right. There, th this is an example of a, of, you know, not a great story. Mm -hmm. Right. This is, and, and the, the saying that I told you before of if there's a product that people actually want at a reasonable price, mm -hmm. um, there's life for you post bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. I sort of, we developed that, or I mean, I developed that with some of my mentors, right, at Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, that was really tested <laughs> at Blockbuster because there was um, a terrible trend, right? a terrible trend line. People were, at the time, the biggest piece was they were just renting videos through their cable box. Yeah. Right? That, like that's that's where it really started before Apple TV yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. So people were just, you know, rather than get up off the couch, yeah. go buy those high margin products yeah. like the the, the candy, yeah. and they would just instead just hit rent. Right. Um and you know, we we were we were in the process of okay, like how do I find the best use, all right, for for this asset at that point? Um, and it turned out the best use of that asset was largely, you know, closing stores, right? Um, and and selling that inventory in 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 a number of sales, and selling the IP separately, uh, and, and you know, finding an attractive bidder for that, um, and it sort of morphed right um the story that that was you know the sort of the underlying financing thesis right um, that the creditors had when they initially put forth their investment it just wasn't so anymore right people were going another way and you know it didn't matter how well you crafted your story mm -hmm. if it doesn't make any logical sense yeah right you gotta you, you gotta look at what you know, people vote with their dollars, people vote with their feet. And that was telling a story that was bad news. People didn't want to hear it. Creditors didn't want to hear it, but it was the truth. And at the end of the day, it made logical sense. And at the end of the day, you know, we had a, there was, there was a process by which we found the highest, best use value for the company and we were able to emerge. Right. Um, I'm condensing a lot in the end of that, right? But um, it was it was a it was a crazy couple years of my life. <laughs> but um, you know, it it's a it's an example of of decisions, right? Um, leading up to. Um, a, a distressed scenario where a company probably waited too long mm -hmm. to address their underlying issues. Mm -hmm. Which, like we said before, not that's the last thing you want to do. <laughs> or else or else you're you're gonna limit your options. What could they have done if they'd have caught it eighteen months earlier? Oof. I at the risk of of um disclosing too much someone had come to them and said i got this great idea we could we could mail dvds to people right mm -hmm. and the company said nah no one's going to do that mm -hmm. and then netflix came out yeah. all right and then someone came to them and said hey i got these vending machines they we can rent dvds through the vending machines mm -hmm. They said, no, oh, no, people want to come to the stores. Like, okay, fine, well, I made these vending machines. A few months later, Redbox is yeah. the thing, right? Um, you know, they were, late to, they were late to digital streaming, you know? Um, 
understanding that, hey, people are voting with their feet to go another way. So I need to revolutionize my business model. I need to start looking at how do I change things, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, they could have changed a lot, right? <laughs> they, 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 they had the chance to be Netflix. They had the chance to be Redbox, you know, for, for that period of time. Yeah. So from a, from a financing state, all they could have really done was extend the runway to failure if, if they were not willing to adapt their strategy. Correct. If you're not if you're not willing to, to adapt, you know, if you're not willing to change your business strategy, there's only very few financing tools at your disposal. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's very few financing tools at your disposal. Mm -hmm. I can either equitize debt or issue you more debt. Mm -hmm. Right. There's not a whole lot else I can do. Mm -hmm. So you're you're basically in a situation like that. You're saying, hey, here is here's your story and here's how the world has changed around your story. You prepared for a world where people were prioritizing experience. And because of that experience and they're used to a world as this is just the way the world is. And so people take their families here and they buy these high margin products and right. they, they rent the videos. And but um, new technology is changing the story. And people like new things. People like trying new things. People like convenience. People uh, like going into the store. But then also, I mean, I, I remember the, the time where I enjoyed going into the store, but then I also liked convenience. And so it was never this situation where I hated Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. um, it was never a, I never got sick of video rental stores. It's just that I started making other decisions. Correct. And, um, and so the narrative of change is people are, are, are prioritizing um, convenience now. Correct. And, and at the volumes that people were coming to the stores in order to, you know, make that worth keeping yeah. the store open, the price would have had to been much, much higher, right. right? It would have been more than digital. And so it didn't make a lot of sense. There yeah. was not a, there's not a believable story there, mm -hmm. how we would have turned those stores around. Yeah. Um, I'll give you another one, but on a no names basis. So dealing with an oil and gas company, mm -hmm. right? During COVID. Okay. And they, you know, at, at that point, right? We'd been dealing with oil and gas companies for five years, right? Um, and they make a commodity, right? It's oil and gas. So they, they make it this commodity. There's, the story is usually pretty straightforward. Yeah. Well, this particular company um, did um, enhanced oil recovery. So they would, they would take CO2, right? And they'd pump it into the ground and they'd be able to get more oil and gas out of the ground. Mm. Um, so you buy up an old oil field. Typically that oil field has infrastructure already in place, change one of the lines to bring in, uh, carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. right? Flood one well and extract from another, mm -hmm. right? The one that's right next over. And all that CO2, a huge portion of it stays in the ground, right? And they wanted to invest in using CO2 that was being pulled out of the air, right? And it was more expensive than CO2 that was just coming out of the ground, right? And you would have been better off, you know, financially for a short period of time, just using the CO2 that's coming out of the ground, right? Um, the CEO did such a wonderful job explaining to people, explaining to creditors whose their job is to, is to invest in distressed debt yeah. or their job is to just finance companies, such a great job explaining to people that by investing in this, investing in this contract, right, with this, with this vendor that pulls CO2 out of the air, I'm putting us on a, on a glide path to, make, to be the biggest carbon capture and storage company in the world, hmm. right? And at the end of the day, that was a tremendous value, right? A couple years on, now they are the biggest carbon capture <laughs> and, and storage company and they're, I believe they just sold to Exxon, right? Like it just turned into a massive, um, a massive value creation story, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
that, you know, if you were just, if you, if you didn't have that guy telling that story, yeah. right, um, ne- you know, you just were looking at the numbers, you'd say, oh, don't need that contract. Uh, right? <laughs> don't, don't need that. Why would I, why would I use that type of CO2, right? That, that's more expensive, you know. Um, but he had the story and he, and he knew how to tell it. And people who were investing, they rallied around it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's how you create real value, right? Mm-hmm. From, a, from an operating standpoint is that's the story. I have a vision. I'm achieving that vision. Um, and he, I'd say probably one of the, the bigger success stories of any of the companies I've ever dealt with on the way out of bankruptcy. And explain why that matters so much, the CO2 capture. I mean, obviously, you hear so much about carbon credits and yeah. things like that. Is, tell me more about that. Why well, it's so important. Um, so <laughs> at, at the risk, how deep do you want me to go? I mean, like there's... there's let, let's, let, let's keep it uh, keep it eighth grade level. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so a large portion of institutions, uh-huh. right, have to look at um, a company's impact mm-hmm. on our climate. Yeah. They're taking responsibility for the fact that, hey, you know what? We're financing this economy. This economy could be destroying our planet. I'm going to start looking at whether or not, or I'm going to start looking at the carbon footprint of these companies right. that I'm investing in. Right. Right. Um, so, um, if you are being carbon neutral and you're in the business of pulling carbons out of the ground, you want and you want to get to the point where you're not having such a large impact, you take the carbon back out of the air and put it back into the ground, mm. right? And so, your ability to achieve financing, right, in the future, um, and even to a certain extent these days, it matters whether or not you you are taking steps necessary to you know, solve for the pollution you put into the air. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's, that's why it's important. So we could all breathe a little mm-hmm. easier in the future. And also because, you know, large institutions are saying this is important to us. Yeah, and so, so we're going to only invest in those sorts of companies. So the story, the, the, the why the story matters is it's saying, hey, we're doing this because we're giving a lot of powerful people what they want. <laughs> Well, and we're giving, we're giving the, you know, we're giving the earth what it needs. Sure, <laughs> sure, but ultimately you can, if, if you can do what the earth needs, but if people aren't happy about it, you need you need someone to feel like that's what they need and people to agree. I, I need I need someone to pay for it. Yes, right. <laughs> I need someone to pay for it. Someone yeah. someone needs to be willing to pay for it. Yeah, and so the, this the, the 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 favor that this that this the favor plus the economic advantage plus, you know, the, the, it almost creates a leverage in the marketplace, it sounds like, because of the, I would say it's probably on paper, but also the reputational um, capital. Well, I, I mean, I'll say um, the... The business government has to make sense too, yeah. right? So the business made a lot of sense, of course, right? <laughs> um, but there's, but there's, you know, the 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 as you said, yeah, you know, there's the well, this contract doesn't make sense. It's an expense. We could do it cheaper, but it's okay. Hold on, you know, there's yeah. there's value in this expense. We can't do. We're not just coming in with a knife, just cutting things. If there's a there's a structure to this, and if there's a narrative that makes economic sense, and and frankly, you know, people. Um, I don't want to dismiss the human element of it. Like I say, there is the financial element of it. But when people feel good and it gives people good feelings, that gives people good feelings about you, gives, gives people good feelings about your company, that's reputational capital that can be just yeah. worth just as much in the marketplace um, as, as a dollar in certain situations. Perfecting this technology, yeah. he knew, was going to be very, very valuable. Yeah. Right? Um, moving the ball forward on that technology he knew was going to be very valuable going forward. There are people, companies yeah. who, you know, we as, as humans 
mm-hmm. needed to get better at that. Mm-hmm. We needed that technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and he saw it, and he was willing to fight for it and argue for it. Yeah. Um, right. And and you're right. There's there's a buyer for that. There's actually lots of buyers for yeah. that. <laughs> there's a lot of buyers for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in, in this you know in this sort of economy, you know, it, it's uh, there's sort of a purchasing of reputational capital. You know, that's kind of the, the thing I'm I'm kind of pushing on here is there's um, things that hit the bottom line financially and a win-win is when you can impact your bottom line in a positive way Correct. and also impact your reputation in a positive way so when you can nail both of those on the on the Correct. same thing that's that's pretty big there are buyers yes right there are buyers out there yeah well tell me about you you know when you it's a you know, you, this is one of those jobs that i think that people don't think about and people think about mm-hmm. You know, when you think about high pressure jobs, there's a lot of things you think of, but you forget about bankruptcies. And so you're dealing with people that are in bankruptcy, dealing with corporations. I say corporate, you know, corporations, but corporations are just composed of people. Mm-hmm. They have personal lives. Those things have to bleed through to you um, to some extent. And you're kind of bearing the emotional pain. You have to kind of play with the role of therapist at times. How does that affect you? And what do you do to, to, to cope? Um, yeah, it bleeds through a little bit. I, I'd say um, it's part of your, it's, you know, it's part of your job, yeah. right? Um, and I think I understand sort of, you know, their emotions. I understand how to explain. Um, that in most cases, it's going to be okay, right? Um, I'd say the, the, one of the hardest parts in, in my job is, is coaching members of my team mm-hmm. to do the same, yeah. right? Um, that, that's the part that it's hard to solve for that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to solve for someone's empathy, mm-hmm. base level of empathy. Um, they either have it or they don't. Um, and if they don't, it really shows. Um, so it, it becomes an exercise of putting the right people in the right place, mm-hmm. right? Um, and for the most part, like, it's, it's good to be able, I don't put them in that position, yeah. right? Like I'm, I'm not the reason why, you know, they're in fi- the company's in financial distress. Yeah, um, I'm just there to help. Mm. And so, from that standpoint, yeah, it's it's a conversation, right? Mm. Um, it's it's one that, uh, you know, I, I get to help them through, mm. but I get to be part of the solution, mm-hmm. and that usually feels pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, the harder part is okay. How do I, how do I train the next guy to do that, mm. um, as well as I have? Right. I'd say over half of my job is, is making sure that I've got the right people in the right position, to, to succeed, um, when when they go to these companies. Yeah. Right. And and, you know, yeah, you sort of put the highly empathetic ones, mm-hmm. in charge of of you know, vendor relationships and mm-hmm. employee relationships and, and you know. The less empathetic ones, you here's your here's your laptop. Go make that Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. So tell me, tell me what else you've learned about people in a job that's so well known to be about finance and about it's about the dollars and it's about the time and when is when is this come due and what can I how can I negotiate this? It just seems like on the outside it seems like such a numbers business, but I keep hearing relationship story, empathy, uh, communication. And I keep, I keep hearing all these words come up that yeah. have so little to do with dollars and cents. It seems at least in, at least in the classroom of learning finance and learning these things. So, well, I, I'd say dollars and cents, they're there yeah. and they matter. Of course. Right. Um, but that's the easy part, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, like I said, the arithmetic is pretty, pretty simple. It's yeah. addition, subtraction, multiplication, 
you know, um, it's not, we're not doing calculus here. <laughs> um, so I, I'd say dollars and cents matter. Um, you know, the, the sound Excel skills, they matter. Um, we, we, we have to, you know, you, you, you're not gonna convince anyone to do anything. You can't tell a story that's about dollars and cents without the math yeah. behind it, right? The math does actually really matter. Um, and navigating the structures really matter. The, mm -hmm. the legal structures really matter. Um, but we, we, I'll say, I probably wouldn't do it justice if I try to dive in deep on that now. And the reason why you don't hear a lot of people wanting to go into restructuring is it's not very applicable to most of investing, mm. right? Um, it's applicable to some of investing. Um, obviously, knowing how to how to you know value something, mm. right, is, is important. But I, you know, we do that very rarely in mm. my line of work, right? We we do valuations, you know, like if a case takes a year, yeah. right? You might value it once. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I typically won't do a normal valuation, I'll do a liquidation analysis, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so I'll be, I'll be valuing like individual assets. Um, so I, I'd say like, but I deal with people every day. <laughs> you know, I deal with a, a pissed off creditor every day. I deal with a with a creditor looking for information, trying to understand an aspect of the business. I deal with that every day. I deal with, you know, senior leadership at companies, um, understanding how to, how to, you know, message things to their employees. We deal with that every day, mm -hmm. right? Um, navigating the process, right? Uh, the, the legal proceeding. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about that a lot mm -hmm. just because, you know, that's the thing people haven't gone through. The, the um, you know, in my particular line of work, I'm never talking about the discount, appropriate discount rate for this for this investment, you mm -hmm. know, for this DCF model. I'm, I'm never really talking about that mm -hmm. um, in my shoes. So, uh, I think that's why is is I'm I'm more of the management side, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm the management consultant in this. There's typically uh, three major professionals, right? A guy like me to help the management team get through this an investment banker, right? To help find mm -hmm. the eventual transaction and execute the transaction mm -hmm. and a lawyer to help navigate the legal proceeding, mm -hmm. right? And I'd say, you know, um, my lane is the more human element. Yeah. What, have you, what um, have you taken home to, you know, your sons? Uh, uh, you, you learn a lot of people lessons. So, I had I had my proudest moment as a father. Okay. Right. Um, I, I told you my my industry used to have a lot more hotheads in it. Yeah, yeah. And those hotheads just were, you know, they a lot of them retired. Yeah. Um, but but more and more, you just see less and less. Of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a rule at my house: we don't yell, mm -hmm. right? Unless uh, unless someone's doing something dangerous mm -hmm. to themselves or others, mm -hmm. right? And my seven-year-old actually forgot what it sounded like for me to yell. He actually had no idea. He said, Daddy, I think you yelled at me the other day. And my, my, my nine-year-old said, no, I didn't. Dad, Dad didn't yell at you. <laughs> and I had to remind him, like, okay, this is what yelling sounds like, right? And he just, he forgot me. He just didn't know. Yeah. Right? Um, so, anyways, the... You, you learn to take a lot more in stride. Yeah. You learn to, to, to sort of remove a little bit of the emotion out of any perceived issue. Yeah. Right? Um, just one, just at least one layer of the onion worth of emotion, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think, you know, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that my job has put me in situations, right? Um, where I get to see people, you know, um, at high levels of emotional tension. Yeah. And I get to react to them um, with 
a little more perspective and understanding, mm. right? I think it, it, it may make me a better father. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm sure your your audience cares less about that than they do the no, dollars and cents. But I think you'd be surprised. <laughs> I think you'd be surprised. I think you'd be surprised. Um, you know, when you when you talk about that, I guess I'm, I want to call it self control. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think that those listening and especially those watching that see you speak and hear your voices, you have a soothing way about you you have a uh, calm and intentional way of speaking your cadence is you don't get in a hurry you don't have uh, there's just there's little drama in the way that you speak when you're speaking professionally and uh, that's interesting to think about that is that you say I, I learned to mm-hmm. was there any is there any guidance you can give us on Besides just, well, I learned to. Can you give us any guidance on the how you learned to, or maybe the state of mind or the things you tell yourself or the wisdom behind how do you, how do you learn that besides just? Yeah. So I came out of school in 2005 um, with a, a year of internship and restructuring. Mm-hmm. And I started off at a called all middle market shop. Um, and got the benefit of a few years of, mm-hmm. of, of work. And then 2008 happened, mm-hmm. right? And all of a sudden, everyone needed restructuring, folks. Right. Right. And what I'd say is mentors matter, mm-hmm. right? Mentors really matter. Um, in my line of work, what clients are paying for? No one, no one's looking for the new up and coming restructuring guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Like, like they're they're looking for perspective. Right. Right. They're looking for experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, when I was selecting which firm I wanted to go to, the people at that firm really mattered, and I'd say. They, they, they say, hey, you're, you're really a blend of the, the five people you spend the most time with. Right. Well, in this line of work, you're going to spend a lot of time with your coworkers. Mm-hmm. And so choosing that, choosing my firm really mattered to me. And I, I can't tell you enough how much of what you see and hear from me, I picked up from the people I consider to be mentors. Mm-hmm. I picked up from, uh, you know, guys like Jeff Stagenga. Um, and and Scott Brubaker and people that you, you don't know the names of mm-hmm. John Stewart you don't know that you don't know these guys not right. that John Stewart <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, like you wouldn't know these guys but in in my industry and in what I do they're the best of the best mm-hmm. and um, I, I I think that's how you learn mm-hmm. is you you pick your mentors carefully um, and and you watch them right so much of my my dad used to say being a good leader starts with being a good follower Mm -hmm. right being a good father starts with being a good son right and the way you learn to sort of manage a crisis is you walk hand in hand with other great crisis managers right and you do that enough you've seen it you 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 know what to do next you Mm -hmm. know what people are thinking you know um you know what the next move should be Mm -hmm. Right, um, that's and that's how you learn it. And that's that's why it's not um, necessarily. That's how you turn what is a crisis into not a crisis. Mm-hmm. I, I was telling a story about uh, a lawyer I'm working with right now. Great dude, um, and I, I I told my friends that hey, working with this guy is like riding in the passenger seat with an Indy car racer, right? He's in total control, right? Um, but objectively from the outside, it looks like we died about five times, right? <laughs> but yet he's in total control. Mm-hmm. And so you, you learned how to be calm by going through those situations with other people who are extremely skilled in those situations. Mm-hmm. So that's part of why, you know, you, you stay at a company like Alvarez and Marsal versus try to 
you know, go off on your own and, and, and do your own thing, right? It's because the the people on that platform you can learn so much from. Mm -hmm. The people on that platform bring so much to the table that you can deploy to to help your clients. Mm -hmm. When you talk about mentorship, you know that's something that comes up a lot, especially with folks coming out of college. As you know, I, I taught several semesters in, at Baylor, and I hear this, you know, about finding mentors. Everybody tells me I need a mentor. And few folks t go about telling how to find mentors and how to communicate with mentors. How do you even initiate a mentorship? It's 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 not like asking for a date. It's not like, hey, <laughs> hey you want to be my mentor? You know, no. um, it's, give it. Talk about, talk about how, how you found mentors and how those relationships develop. Um, they look a lot like friendships. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like finding a friend. Um, that you're, you're right. You don't say, hey, do you want to be my mentor? Mm -hmm. Right? Like you, I'm pretty sure I've never said that to yeah. anyone. Right? <laughs> Although I think I've got a great group of mentors. Yeah. Um, and I think that they consider me a friend mm -hmm. and that I consider them friends. Mm -hmm. And... I learned so much from them, and I think they probably learned maybe hopefully one or two little things from me, right? Yeah. Um, things that I bring to the table, right? Um, stuff from my generation, like how to post this to social media, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, you know how to how to how to make this Excel table work, or or how to make this PowerPoint work, right? Just yeah, we help each other mm -hmm. in a number of ways. That's part of my job, but I think we do it in a way that's that's relationship based yeah. right that, i mean it comes down to that uh, so a big piece of it's just treat them like you would a, a friend mm -hmm. treat them like you would your your dad or or your brother right um don't don't treat them like a boss who they're you're you know they're responsible for you and treat them with respect right. right you treat your friends you treat your dad you treat your brother with respect um but Friendship's the basis of those mentorship relationships, at least in my view. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What are you reading right now? Or what have you read recently that's impacted you? Ooh. Um, I'm reading a book on, on evolutionary psychology by David Buss. Yeah. Um, God, it's the, um, it's like the evolution of desire, yeah. something like that. Um, it's great. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, I think, you know, behavioral psychology is, is a very, it's just an interesting, um, evolutionary psychology is just an interesting lens yeah. with which to look through things and how it affects so much of our behavior. And, and frankly, a lot of what, you know, um, I sort of growing up was told all of this, that, that's just cultural. Yeah. It's like, well, is it? Is it yeah. really cultural? Right. Right? Because if so, then these cultures that don't actually interact with each other, well, then they would come to different outcomes. Why are they so similar? Why are they so similar? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting book. Um, I, I really, you know, I, I, I tell people, I can't, can't tell people enough how much um, I like the book The Boy Crisis. Okay. I think that's a great book. Anyone who, you know, has has little boys um was a little boy um you know has brothers right has fathers everyone basically should read that book yeah because i think it's it's super interesting read um i don't know i stay away from i i stay away from fiction mm -hmm. i you know um i'm sure there are some people out there who thinks david buss is fiction but like i, I try to stay away from fiction i try to i try to read books that you know I think, uh, I think, give me useful information. Yeah, you know, I, I think I've, I've been, I read a lot of fiction as a kid. I was a prolific fiction reader, mm -hmm. loved, loved reading. And then I definitely went through, I think most of my adult life has been avoiding fiction. I, I read facts and nonfiction, that sort of thing. And I think recently I've sort of thought, you know, I need to challenge myself to remember who I am and where I came from and understand that narratives matter. We talk about telling stories and mm -hmm. things like that. And I think that I've kind of challenged myself recently to think about adding in a little bit of fiction mm. um, because it it is how 
we learn. Just like when it, it gives you access to relationships that you wouldn't un, otherwise be able to have access to. Sure. It gives you access to situations you would have access to. And it gets lets you view these things. I mean, I think that we can say you can get those things from movies. But, um, but yeah, it's something that, uh, that I've, I've put on my list for this year is uh, so when I say I've come to this intellectual conclusion that I need to do that <laughs> and I want to when I put some more fiction in, I've not quite done that yet. Mm -hmm. I did uh, I did buy a fiction book that I haven't read yet, so that's the first step is getting yeah. on my getting it on my book my bookshelf. Um, but yeah, the boy catch. I haven't read that book yet, but I'm familiar with some of the content in it, and it's it's interesting. You know, we've the the crisis is going to change in the next few years, and we tend to be behind. And culture tends to be behind the research and. I think the boy crisis covers something that, you know, we've we've done a lot of things to enhance um, the plight of women and justifiably so. And, you know, I think the next thing we're going to have to figure out is how do we bring men back up without without hurting women? Right. It's right. we've done so much to to enhance women and um, and boys are falling behind fast and in everything and um, generationally speaking um, it's, it's so with millennials with women being ahead of men in general and, and earning potential and things like that and also it's even more pronounced with gen z they're getting more education they're having higher salaries they still want to marry men who are of equal of, or higher status but there's fewer of those men and on average women are what are ahead of these things now and um, i think when we look at young men today the world is going to look the, the struggles that women are going to it, that are going to um, face are the uh, side effects of what is what's happening with with little boys right now um, and, the, and the struggles that they're facing. So it will be interesting to see how these things play out in, in the future, both economically and on the marriage and dating front and things like that. But, um, yeah, how do we maintain the progress that we have that we have gained with with women but yet also focus on boys to make sure that they're the men that they should be that these incredible women deserve right exactly <laughs> exactly most of those women are going on to marry men yeah <laughs> and, and hopefully hopefully those those men are well-rounded <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely well um you know we've had a long talk today uh pete tell have me we? it feels like uh, it, it feels it, like it, like it was only five minutes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it feels it, like it went fast. It was, it was, it was long, but I, I want to give you a chance to, to to kind of open up about the way you spoke about communication and empathy and things like that. And I think that your demeanor is part of the strength of your communication. And but I don't want to to, to pigeonhole you. And I'd, I'd love to say open ended, Pete. What would you like to share with us today? What, what wisdom can you drop on us or experience or? <laughs> Or, or just the time you got kicked in the teeth and learned a lesson. We, 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 yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we are, yeah. So this is my this is my my hot take, right? I think we are in an extremely interesting time um, as an economy, right? Um, so this has nothing to do with empathy, mm -hmm. but I, I do think we are in an extremely interesting time as an economy. We we. Um, approaching 40% of households with no mortgage, right? Um, of the 60% that do have a mortgage, um, roughly half of those, um, well, more than half of those, have a mortgage of under 4%, Yeah. right? And so you, you see a tightness in the housing market that, you know, is really not precedented for as long as you and I have been alive, yeah. right? Um, we've not seen sort of new home sales spike, yeah. right? Um, I'm sure you, you you talk about this a lot with your clients, but I, I'm dealing with it more on friends that, that hey, I'm, I'm not gonna sell this house and move up. I can't afford to, yeah. right? I'm, I'm gonna stay in this house till I die, yeah. right? But, you know, the value of the house is doubled. So like, how do I, deploy, how do I tap and deploy some of that capital? I think it's going to be an interesting problem that we face and that our economy is going to try to navigate around over the next, call it three to five years yeah. in the housing market um, where there's not the mobility that there once was. Um, I think that 
you know, AI is going to completely change the way that we do business, right? Um, it's going to be like electricity. Not not a lot of people understand how electricity works. It just yeah. works, right? And is really just underlying everything that we do. Um, I think that is sort of the key to our inflationary pressures, right? Um, is, is real productivity gains yeah. through the application of, of AI and robotics. Um, I think. Uh, I think. I you know, I think a lot of people are going to make a lot of money in crypto. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a long-term asset that you don't have to worry about, I think it, I think it sucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I think it's eventually going to be used by institutions. Um, and, and I think, like I said, a lot of people are going to make a lot of money investing it, but I, I just, I got to think that governments are going to, are going to actually start, um, regulating that more like real money yeah. <laughs> in the not so distant future. Yeah. Um, I can't, I can't see them. You know, continuing to just al- allow it to to be a um, a massive store of value outside of their 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 reign of control. Yeah. Um, from an empathy front, um, you know, I, I see COVID and the death of the office culture as being a major force in the reshaping of of sort of our uh, relationship frameworks Mm. going forward, right? Um, People that we, you know, people that we hired during COVID, they don't necessarily have the experience of the office, right? All those jokes are gonna gonna fall flat here in the not so distant future. (laughs) And, And I think, you know, it's gonna it's, it's gonna matter whether or not um, the people that they've worked with have made an effort to socialize with them yeah. and bring them into their social circles, but the way they would have um, if if they were if there was an office, yeah, right. Um, but I I I can talk for days about any of this stuff, right? It's all very interesting to me, but. I, I admit it's probably more interesting to me than it is to most people. I, 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 maybe most people, but uh, I, I think most people aren't listening to this podcast trying to, <laughs> trying to, trying to learn from, 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 you, from you and me. So if they've made it this far, they're, they, they, they're probably interested. So, um, you know, we, obviously the, 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 a lot of firms have brought people back to the office and are trying to re-engage that. That's got its own problems there mm-hmm. as, as well. Uh, what are you thinking? We, um, as far as firms bringing people back, yeah. I think it's it's a um, it will be a tough selling point and a negotiating point, right? For talent, I I, I love it. If you want to bring people back and those people don't want to come back, and I figured out systems to to you know socialize and and grow that those people without bringing them back. That's great. You will have the second best class of talent yeah. because I will have the first best class, mm-hmm. right? Because it's undeniably appealing, right? It's really hard to micromanage people in person, but really good people, you don't have to micromanage. Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> I, there's technology being, I won't tell how I know this, and maybe I don't know how, how public this is or not, but that there's technology right now that is being piloted at companies in Dallas uh, that they have cameras that can track you with AI. They know when you look away. They know when, you're, when your eyes are on your computer and when you're working, when you're up at the time you're up out of your desk. The level of micromanagement is incredible. And <laughs> I, re- I remember, you know, when, uh, when I was in my early 20s to get my first job and, you know, I'm, I'm an advisor and they tracked, you know, the number of times we dialed the phone, number of times, mm-hmm. um, number of times we talked to people that they could, track our the time we spent actually on the phone and we thought that was intrusive of just the time, the time on the phone but now yeah. it's uh that sort of thing is is only going to push people away and make the the distance between the haves and the has nots because status will be yeah. is someone does someone know when you're out of your desk or not does right. someone know the 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 minutes per day that your eyes were connected to your screen 
And status is no one's tracking that. And that will be a the type of jobs that people want. And Correct. that people, um, here's the thing about where we're at today is when people want things, they feel entitled to them because that's the culture now is anything I want, anything that anyone has, I should be entitled to. And that's, that's, um, that's going to be interesting, especially as AI and other things. We, we, oh, I think we thought that AI was going to take away all the um, low skill jobs. Mm-hmm. And that's not the first thing that it did. Um, robotics has taken away a lot of those things, which right. are enhanced by AI, obviously. Um, but we're seeing a lot of skill jobs be, be taken uh, by AI. And I think that you know, when you look at this, the, the, the status of it, of not being tracked versus tracked, I think that's something that I've even only just begun to start thinking of is mm-hmm. because freedom, you know, how much freedom, how much liberty do you have to do your, your role? Um, and then we've got the fact that, you know, with robotics and things, the, the base level uh, value added that it requires to contribute to our society is going up. Yes. And so there are, you know, we still have, and I know this is, you know, something that, 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 that's controversial to discuss, but we still have, I believe in IQ. And I believe <laughs> that, that there are limits on certain, how much people can, can do, you know, of, of different things. And so, you know, as we increase the base level of value that one might add, we're going to have an increasing amount of people um, at the bottom that what can they do? To, to add value to provide for their family. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the a real driving force that's going to be, in, you know, and obviously you have talks of, and, you know. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, right, there are firms out there, a lot of consulting shops, if you will, who understand that their asset is people. Mm-hmm. And we invest in our people. Mm-hmm. And it's very important when we make that commitment to that person, we bring them on, we hire them, that we are pouring experience and knowledge and capability into those people. And so, yeah, you're right. The base level to contribute is going to be higher. It's going to be more and more important that you go to organizations that actually want to invest in you, yeah. that actually care about making you better versus how do I squeeze 10 more milliseconds of your eyeball on the monitor. Yeah. Right? And, and I, I, I got to say, like, you know, um, yeah. if, if you're not the asset, right, of your firm, then there's a good chance you're part of the product, yeah. right? And, and, I, and that, that's, that's just the, they're, they're trying to get you to the lowest common denominator at that point, right? Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's a, doesn't solve the societal issue, right? But I think on a, on a, you know, how does an individual go about making sure that they don't fall into that trap is go work for companies that actually want to invest in your skill set, yeah. as opposed to just make you part of their product. Have I ever told you why I think my brother and I both gravitated towards crisis management? <laughs> no. Have I not told you no, that story? No, no, let's do it. It's a good story. Um, so, my brother and I were, were both at Alvarez and Marsal, right? Um, we're both managing directors, partners in the firm. And it's not, you know, the mainstream, you know, path in finance, right? Like, like you would have thought one of us would have at least, you know, gone into private equity or gone into to money management or do wealth management or become a trade or something, right? Um, but we both sort of gravitated to this and and i think it has a lot to do with our dad right um my dad was in a wheelchair Mm -hmm. right um from the time he was 19 Mm -hmm. right he he used the wheelchair got in a car accident Mm -hmm. and so growing up we we're already dealing with crisis Mm -hmm. on a personal level, doing day-to-day things, right? Um, I remember 
grew up in California, and there was a time where my dad fell out of his wheelchair. It was a hot day, and the pavement was super hot, right? And I was probably eight at the time, and we had, you know, it was just me and him. We, I had to, he was shouting for me to, to help him by, I went and grabbed a blanket and threw it on the ground so he could roll over onto it, mm -hmm. right? We just had to deal with crisis, mm -hmm. right? At a very young age, um, you know, we were born in the, I was born in the 80s. My brother was born in the late 70s. I remember, you know, there's a story of, of you know, my dad sending us into the gas station um, to, to buy him things or sending us into grocery stores to buy him things so he wouldn't have to get out of, out yeah, of the, yeah. the seat of the car, right? And then everything that my dad had to do was maximum effort, yeah. right? It was all max effort because it was it's hard life sort of, you know, grooming yourself, getting dressed, right. doing the laundry, doing the cooking, right? Doing all that stuff when you're in a wheelchair, it's, it's just, it, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And so that turned into my brother and I doing wrestling. Mm -hmm. That turned into us, I think, picking, you know, one of the more intense forms of financial advisory. And it just sort of got into our system. Um, and I, I, I credit him with it. And I think a big part of why I love Alvarez and Marcel um, is because there's a familiar family story um, kind of at, at the head of our firm, right? There's, there's the, you know, with Tony Alvarez, there's a dad who founded the firm. Um, his sons are still active in the firm, right? Um, and and they, they sort of, it sort of got in their blood just became a part of who they are. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really think that's part of what sort of bound my brother and I, um, both to the industry and partially to the firm. Mm -hmm. do, do you feel like that your experience as the younger brother um, influenced you in any, in any in, 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 to, to, to an extent? In this crisis, in this, in this household that experienced frequent crisis due to your father being in the wheelchair? Um, so there's, there's a six year spread between my brother and I. Yeah. Um, so when he was off to college and I was sort of, you know, growing into an adult, yeah. Um, yeah, my dad was a little bit older, mm -hmm. right? And then there weren't two of us, there was just me, right? right? <clears throat> so I'd say I, I have a slightly different experience but i think it's interesting my brother and i are very different people um so i it's hard to say if that's nature or nurture mm -hmm. you know what i mean um it's hard to say if that's nature or nurture but i i definitely think my dad's sort of medical issues were probably more pronounced when i was um you know helping him by myself yeah i mean i had a different father than my brother had Mm -hmm. you now my brother's 14 years older than right. me, and it was just different dads. Yeah. My dad was the old dad, you know, <laughs> and there was just two when he was a boy, and then I, I was the fourth, mm -hmm. and the big gap between the older two and the younger two. And so we, we were, were, were alike in many ways, but it's also very clear that we had very different experiences with our father. The things that we did with our father, the things that we remembered about our father, um, who our father was. And, you know, he being, you know, the center, when you're the oldest boy, you're the center of focus in certain ways. And when you're the oldest girl, you're the focus in certain ways, but mm -hmm. not others. And, you know, for us, there was two boys and two girls big gap between them, 14 years between the twins and then my sister and I. And I think that's something that I've thought about is, you know, just how complex the world is that you're, that you're living in. He was playing college football, you know, uh, at Auburn University when I was, you know, a kid, I was four. Right. You know, he leaves when I'm, when I'm four. I can, 
can't even remember these first couple of years, you know. Mm-hmm. And so there's that, you know, the, just the, the, the different ways that attention is focused, different ways that the different struggles the family has, you know, during those times. And um, the fact that those older siblings are still influencing the family when there was no influence there was no, there was not these additional major influences there mm-hmm. when they were growing up, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, again, Peter Mosley, managing director at Alvarez and Marsal. It's been great to have you on Untamed Ethos today. Look forward to having you again in the future. Thank you so much, Joshua.